Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to each one of you, whether you're joining us for the first time or whether you do so regularly. And even though we can't see each other or can't meet together in one place, it's a real blessing that we can do so by means of this technology that we can join together to worship God together. And I'm going to start our service this morning by reading some verses from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from destruction and crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence and we want to, to bless your name, to praise your name. We thank you that you do rule over all in heaven and that you rule uh, with justice and in righteousness. And we thank you that you give all good things to your people and indeed to all of your creation. And we thank you for all your many benefits, both spiritual and physical. Father, we thank you for these lovely words which talk about your loving kindness and your grace and your mercy and your patience. And we thank you especially uh, that you have forgiven us all our sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far you have removed our transgressions from us, forgiven and forgotten. We thank you that this is only possible because you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to be the saviour of the world. We thank you for that once for all sacrifice that he made for us on the cross, that he bore his our sins and his body on the tree so that we could be forgiven and made uh, part of your family. We thank you that we can call you our Heavenly Father. We thank you that you know all about us, that you know our frame, that we are weak and feeble and uh, uh, sinful, Lord. And we thank you that your word says that you will renew our strength like eagles as we wait upon you. And so, Father, we just thank you once again for all your benefits towards us. And we pray, Lord, that you might help us just like David to say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise your uh, name. And Father, we bring our service before you this morning and we just ask for your blessing upon all aspects of it. We pray for uh, the word that will be spoken to the children and later to the adults. Lord, we just pray by your spirit that you would bless it to every heart. And Lord, we just pray that you would help each one to respond in faith and obedience and trust. We pray this in the name of our Saviour, Lord Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Junior Church. I hope you've been enjoying uh, half term this week. Um, this week in Junior Church, I want to tell you another parable. This is taken from Mark chapter 12. And just before Jesus was telling this parable, he had been riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Really well known part of the Bible where Jesus uh, had, was coming into Jerusalem and the people were waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. Um, they knew that Jesus was special. He was the coming king. But the religious leaders, the teachers, the chief priests, they didn't like this idea at the time. They were starting to question his authority. And so at that time, Jesus told the people and all listening this parable. And I have to say, this doesn't end well. It's not a nice ending. But 
Jesus told about a man who planted a vineyard. He had some land and he planted a vineyard. He built a wall around it. He built a tower that it could be watched over and it was beautiful. But he was moving away to another area. And so he decided to rent out that bit of the, the vineyard to some farmers. The farmers grew um, some of the fruit in the vineyard. And when it came to harvest time, the landowner decided that he would send some servants to collect some of the fruit from the farmers for himself. But this didn't go down well with the farmers at all. And they beat up his servant and sent him back to the man, back to the landowner. And so he sent another servant uh, to collect some fruit. And they beat him up even worse. And they sent him packing back to the landowner. So the landowner thought, well, I'm, I'm, I, want to, I want to have some of this fruit from, from the vineyard that I created. And so he sent another servant. But the farmers killed him. The landowner thought, well, I sent, sent another servant. And they killed him too. And the landowner, I just wanted to get some of the fruit from the vineyard. And at this stage, all the servants were, were, were killed, were beaten. And there was only one left, and it was his son. So the landowner thought, well, look, I'm going to send my son, who I love very much. But I think the farmers, they're going to respect the fact that he's my son. And so that's what he did, and he sent his son but the farmers killed his son too because they had a cunning plan. They thought if we kill his son, his heir, then the land, the vineyard will be ours because he won't be able to pass it on to his son. And Jesus said, well then in that case, what's the landowner going to do? And he said, of course, he's going to send, he's going to go He's going to kill the farmers himself because of the way he's treated, they've, they've, they've treated um, his, his servants and his son. And Jesus then at that point quoted part of the Bible from Psalm 118. It says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the really important part of the building, the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvellous in our eyes. That was a really strange way to finish the story, the parable, which was a bit strange in itself. So what was Jesus trying to tell the people? Well, as Jesus talked about the vineyard and the farmers, he was likening it to the Israelites and Israel, God's chosen people. And God had been gracious and patient with the Israelites over so many years, just as the landowner had been. And as the landowner sent servants back to collect the fruit time and time again, so God had sent prophets back to the people of Israel, urging them to turn back to God. But so often they were killed and persecuted by Israel's leaders at that time. And so the, the landowner, as a last resort, sent his beloved son back to collect the fruit and was killed. And so, as a last resort, God had sent his beloved son, Jesus. And Jesus, at that time, was really speaking out against the leaders of Israel who were rejecting Jesus as king. And so the question for us this week really is, will we also reject and ignore God? Or will we um, let Jesus be in charge? Will we let him be the strong foundation that we build our life on uh, this week and in the coming weeks? Maybe as things are hard at school, uh, at home school, uh, will we ask Jesus for help in, in the, the little things and the big things? So thanks so much for listening and see you soon.
see is the battle You see my victory When all I see is the mountain You see a mountain And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me family of Hollywood Baptist Church. I just want to read some verses to you, well-known verses from Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him or acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Well, here we are in February 2021, almost a year since COVID first hit, and it seems completely foreign to think that this time last year, we at Scripture Union had just held a big schools ministry conference, and we were gearing up for another year of summer activities and camps and missions. 
Little did we, and so many others like us, of course, know then that things like social distancing and lockdown and working from home and government restrictions would turn things on their heads so much within Christian ministry. And yet, as we've heard so many people say within the past year as well, we can see how God has been at work, how God has been directing our paths and creating new opportunities within so many challenges as we seek to trust him day by day. Online schools ministry has become the norm for our schools workers in SU and training resources department too, opening doors into new schools for us and allowing our staff to use their amazing creative skills in new ways and collaborative ways on new platforms. So things like seasonal online assemblies for Christmas and Easter, we've got a new set of mental health lessons coming soon with an RE focus of course, um, weekly assemblies, spoken word pieces, feel free to check them out on our Facebook pages or, or through the Scripture Union Northern Ireland YouTube channel if you haven't seen those already. The feedback back from teachers on, on just how God is using those kind of resources has been incredibly encouraging. There's a hunger out there, a spiritual hunger still out there, uh, and these, these resources seem to be really hitting the mark and God is using them. But obviously we deeply miss that face-to-face -face contact with children and young people and just that joy of interacting with, with pupils and teachers on a daily basis in schools. And so we're trying to create as much opportunity as possible to pray, uh, for communities and churches to pray much for our schools and teachers and principals and all those dealing with the complexities of education at the moment and, and seeking to hear God and how he would have us to respond relationally and compassionately uh, as much as with online content. So do keep an eye out particularly on our own area here with Rachel Tweedy as our North Down and Newton Arts schools worker for, for prayer opportunities to meet with others and pray for our schools. In terms of our Camps and Missions ministry, which usually has about 40, over 40 different activities and, and around 1,200 volunteers, leader invo leaders involved, really this year we have three main aspirations for summer 2021. So as a volunteer movement, we want to continue to recruit volunteers, investing in them and providing opportunities for them to serve. As an organisation with a heart for the Bible and, and mission, we endeavour to open the Bible creatively with children and young people in person this summer. And of course, we remain committed to the safety and the well-being of all volunteers and children and young people and their families, particularly within this new COVID world that we now live in. And so with all of that in mind, we've, we've got the bones of some initial stripped back plans, if you like, for the summer in place, which means unpicking many of the ways we're used to doing things, actually. But once again, we can see how God is leading us through this. With those well-known verses of, of Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, always before us for each step, even though at times it does feel like there's a huge mountain ahead. So we'd appreciate your prayers for wisdom and all of that, particularly for the summer, and particularly as a key staff member has now gone off on maternity leave as well, which is wonderful, but also means that there's a much increased workload all around. And amidst all of that, like everyone else, our staff are still working from home. Some are still on flexible furlough, uh, dealing with many complications remotely. And we're still on the lookout as well for new office premises and, and just reconsidering what our needs are in that respect and what the financial implications of the past year are going to be for us in SU. But of course, we're so grateful for the ongoing support financially of, of so many churches and individuals. And of course, I'm personally so grateful for the support that Hollywood Baptist Church continues to give to SU as well, not just financially, but prayerfully and in so many other ways as well. Thank you. And so as we look to the future, please do pray with us that together we will continue to trust God with all our hearts, acknowledge him in all our ways, and that he will indeed direct our paths every step of the way.
In Isaiah chapter 26 and verses 3 and 4, speaking about God, we read the following words. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord is everlasting strength. And the Lord uh, encourages us to keep our focus on him, to trust in him completely, so that in doing so that we might experience that perfect peace, that supernatural peace that only he can give. So let's pray now and bring our prayers for others before him. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in you is everlasting strength. We thank you that you never grow faint or weary. We thank you that your understanding is unsearchable. And so we bring before you our prayers and confidence that you will hear them and answer them according uh, to your will. And Father, we bring before you our world and all its need. Uh, we think of those who are uh, experienced suffering in war-torn areas or due to poverty or other deprivations. And we pray that you would have mercy upon them. And Lord, we do pray for uh, leaders around the world that you would just help them to, to rule their people with justice and with compassion uh, and in a right way. And Father, we just think again of the coronavirus, which still grips our world, Lord. And we just pray that in your mercy that you would bring it uh, to an end. And we thank you for progress made with vaccinations and other treatments. And we pray, that, Lord, that you would just help this uh, process of vaccination just to, to spread very quickly around the world so that as many people as possible will be protected. Lord, uh, we bring before you our own governments in Westminster and Stormont. We pray that you would help them to rule uh, us rightly in, in all things, Lord, and in particular that at the moment you would give them wisdom uh, to help us work through this coronavirus pandemic, Lord. It's not an easy job that they have, and we just pray that we would continue to, to pray for them as you ask us to do. Father, we just think of all the effects that coronavirus has had upon us, Lord. We think of those who have lost loved ones, Lord, that you would comfort them. We think of those who are still in a hospital, Lord, that your hand would be upon them in healing. Uh, and for those who have recovered but still having some effects, Lord, that you would uh, heal those as well, as, well, as well, Lord. And Lord, we think of the effect on um, uh, people's livelihood, whether their business or their jobs, Lord. And again, that you would just help in that, Lord, and, and just help people to, to, to cope with the situation that they find themselves in. We think of our young people whose education has been so uh, badly disrupted, Lord, and we just pray again for your hand to be upon them and just help help them and ease any anxiety that they might have. We think of uh, those who are juggling work and at the same time uh, helping their children at home with schooling. Lord, just help them and give them patience and strength uh, for that task. And Lord, we pray for our health service, all who work in it, and our hospitals and in uh, general practice and in the community, Lord, just uh, keep them safe and help and strengthen them, Lord, as they as they seek to help uh, people who are ill at the moment or in, in the prevention of uh, people getting ill, Lord. And Lord, we just uh, bring before you now uh, those in our fellowship who particularly need our prayers. Lord, we bring before you Edith and her family, Lord, and we just pray that they may know your peace and comfort at this time. Lord, we pray for those uh, who are particularly ill, Lord, uh, and again we pray for your hand to be upon them, uh, uh, giving them peace and comfort and ease, Lord. We think of those who are suffering effects of uh, being on their own, uh, maybe anxious or lonely, Lord. We just pray again that you would be with them and that you would be their peace and that they might find support uh, from your people. And Lord, we uh, just think of uh, the world around us, Lord, and, and the need uh, for people to hear the gospel of hope, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we just pray for our, our mission partners, Lord, that you would help them as they adjust to, to doing things in a different way. We think of our partner churches, Lord, in different parts of the world, that you would uh, just again help them as they seek to get the message of the gospel out to others. We thank you for time spent with our friends from Romania, Lord, during the week 
And again, Lord, the situation that they find themselves in at the moment, Lord, we just pray that you would help them to, to persevere uh, in helping the community around them in practical ways, but also to share the hope of the gospel. And Father, we pray for every endeavour uh, that seeks to, to share the good news of the gospel around the world. We pray that you would prosper it, Lord, and that many would be drawn into your kingdom. We ask all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Savior, Spirit, lead me 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're continuing this morning our study of the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, first century Philippi, which would now be in, in modern day Greece. A church begun by himself and uh, Silas with God's Spirit, of course, working uh, about 10 years previously. Uh, Paul finds himself in prison, almost certainly in Rome, uh, with a very uncertain future. And news has just come to him from the, the, the church in Philippi. Uh, and it's mainly good news. The church is going well, but there are, there are a few disagreements. We don't know exactly what they are. He does mention them later on the letter. Some, some people seem not to be getting on. Uh, and so Paul takes the opportunity to send a letter back to the church in Philippi with the messenger who's brought the letter to him. And so we have Paul's words here uh, as he sends this letter back to uh, the, the church, this young church uh, in Philippi. And we're going to read together uh, from Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 27, and we'll read on in to the start of chapter 2. So this is Paul writing to early believers in a real church, in a real situation, uh, and we have his letter preserved for us. So this is Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We finish there at chapter 2, and verse 11. Well, Paul has been talking about his uncertain future, about the fact that he's in prison and he's not exactly sure what's going to happen to him. Uh, he'd love to be free to, to come and help the Philippians, but if, if his imprisonment ends in death, well, he, he's happy to accept that if it comes. But now he turns his attention to some of those issues that he's heard about, some of the, maybe the problems that he's heard about in the, in the church. And so he says, verse 27 there, whatever happens, whatever happens to me, here's what I want you to do. And he gives them a real challenge. He makes a plea to them. He says, first of all, uh, live lives worthy of the gospel. Live lives worthy of the gospel. Uh, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. That's really the key point. Uh, behave as citizens worthy of the gospel, he says. Philippi was a Roman colony, a Roman citizen. It had a special status uh, bestowed on it by the Romans. People living in Philippi had exactly the same rights as people living in Rome. Uh, they had the same rights and privileges, and they, they took great pride in living up to that honor. They, they spoke Latin in the main, uh, they dressed in a Roman way, uh, and they, they, were, they were very happy with the status that the Romans had given them. Well, Paul says, Christians have an even greater status given to them by God, greater than Roman citizenship. Christians are, are citizens of heaven. Uh, and Paul says, we, we must live up to it. If you're a Christian, if you're a citizen of heaven, then you must live up to it. Uh, and what does that look like in practice? Well, well, Paul lays three challenges before the church. He says, first of all, verse 27, stand firm. Stand firm in one spirit or stand together uh, as one man, if you're allowed to say one man, as one person. Uh, with one mind, contending for the faith of the gospel. The ESV translation says, standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side 
for the faith of the gospel. Paul wants to avoid divisions in the church. The Philippians were, were experiencing opposition to the gospel, just as Paul had when he first began the church 10 years previously. Paul ended up beaten and put in jail along with Silas. And that's what the people are still facing today. Here's what happened to Paul. We read this back in Acts chapter 16 when he was in Philippi. They brought them, that's, that's Paul and Silas, before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Roman citizens to accept or practice. So they were saying, what, what they're doing is contrary to, to our, our citizenship in Rome. This is not the way we should be behaving. Uh, and the gospel challenged uh, th that Roman way of behavior, uh, the, the Roman customs of which the people were very proud. Uh, and the opponents of, of the Christian church want, want to cause the Christians to flee and disarray. They want to discourage the Christians in the church. And Paul urges them to stand together against that opposition. And, th and he says in verse 28, don't, don't be frightened. That, that's the only use of that word in the whole of the New Testament. And it has the idea of, of a stampede of horses that have been startled by something running, fleeing for safety. Uh, Paul says, you're not to be scattered in fear and confusion the way the enemies want. But that requires unity. That requires you to stand together, to stand firm in, in the face of attack. And that will show their enemies that ultimately they will be victorious uh, and the enemies themselves will, will be defeated. And Paul reminds them that it's a privilege to suffer for the gospel. It, it was the norm in, in the first century. It certainly wasn't something to be sought after, but it was something not to be feared if it came along. We read earlier on in, in Acts, that Peter and the early apostles considered it a joy, and they rejoiced because they'd been worthy, found worthy of suffering disgrace for the gospel. When they were arrested, they were actually joyful because they thought their faith had been noticed. And Jesus himself said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Jesus said, To be persecuted is to be blessed, is to experience blessing. And Paul reminds him of that. He says, don't worry when you're up against it, when you face opposition, just as I did. Uh, God will bless you uh, as a result. Then we turn on over to chapter 2. And of course, there, there were no chapter divisions. This was just one letter Paul wrote. The, the divisions were, were put in later. And he then says, if your faith really means anything to you, um, if you have Jesus' love deep in your hearts, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, uh, by having attitudes to one another that reflect the love that Jesus had for you and that you have for him. Maybe the news of this disagreement was the only thing that stopped uh, Paul having complete joy about the church. He was joyful to hear that they were continuing in the faith, but, but this was bothering him, this disunity uh, that seemed to be mentioned. And, and so he gives him a challenge and he says, seek agreement, verses one and two there. Be like-minded. Have the same love for one another which Jesus had for you. Be one in spirit and purpose. Put disagreements to one side. Uh, see how much that unites you. And then secondly, in verses 3 and 4, show humility. Uh, examine your lives. Examine your motives. There should be no rivalry or, or pride or, or no trying to build a reputation for yourself. Uh, think of others more highly than you think of, you, you, of yourselves. Maybe Paul had in mind some of those people he'd already mentioned in his letter who seemed to be preaching out of rivalry and, and for, uh, for false motives. Maybe he had them in, in mind when he says, exercise humility, consider others better than, than yourselves. If you ever watched The, the Apprentice on television, you'll have seen the, the, the teams working together. The, the contestants were set, uh, put into teams to uh, set different tasks, and they all worked together during the task. But then the losing team ended up in the boardroom and they had to defend themselves to try and avoid being sacked by, by Lord Sugar. And then it was every man and woman for him or herself. Uh, it was dog eat dog. And suddenly the unity uh, had disappeared altogether. And each one was trying to uh, persuade Lord Sugar that, that they were the best. Well, that's the complete opposite of the humility that, that Paul is speaking about here. He's saying, think of others as better than, than yourself. Uh, that's exactly the opposite of what our uh, competitive society expects, and probably what the society in his day expected as well. And he says, don't just think about yourself. Consider other people's needs too. Put aside the, the secondary disagreements and put the gospel first. That's how you will present a, a, united, a united message, a united front to, to, the, to the, the world, to the society you're in. And that's how people will see 
th that your faith means so much to you. Well, you may say, that, that's all very well, but, but you don't know so-and-so. You, you don't know the people I have to get on with. And maybe the people in Philippi were, were thinking the same thing. You know, as, as we look around our church today, or well, I'm looking around an empty church, but if you imagine the, the people in the church, there's some you find it hard to get along with. We all have people we, we like better than, than others. There's some with whom we disagree. Some maybe we, we've fallen out with or had a dispute at some time in the past over a particular issue. Something similar had obviously happened in Philippi. But Paul turns their attention away from themselves. He says, try not to focus on those things that, that cause division, those things that you maybe have disagreed about. Remember Jesus. Remember the love that he had for you. Love for people who are very often unlovable. That's the attitude you should have uh, to one another. And so he goes on between verses 5 and 11 to say that we should have the same attitude as Jesus. Paul uh, uses these words, some of the best known words in the New Testament, and it's not clear whether Paul wrote these words or whether he's quoting an early Christian hymn. Uh, there's all sorts of discussion and debate about the style of Greek use and whether this is Paul's words or, or, or already written words. Any good commentary will give you all the details. We, we don't need to go into those now. Either way, it's God's word to us. But we need to remember the context here. There were disagreements affecting the church in Philippi. And verse 5 is maybe the key to all that follows. When Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Jesus, who is actually God himself, who gave up his rights, verse 7, who emptied himself. There's no other use of that little phrase anywhere in Greek literature. Jesus emptied himself. He gave up all his rights. He never ceased to be God, but he accepted limitations to his glory. He didn't lose his glory. He became a servant. The word used there is the word doulos, literally a slave. Uh, the slaves in Rome had no particular rights. They, they belonged to their owners. And Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, where he looked forward to the Messiah and called him the suffering servant. Jesus came as a servant, took on human likeness, born as a human, still God, but taking on our, our humanity, our frailty, uh, in all but sin. It's hard for us to, to fully comprehend that. It's hard for us to, to get our finite minds round how that could be, how Almighty God could, could lay aside in the form of his Son, could, could lay aside his glory and limit his glory to become one of us. In the lovely song, The Servant King, written by Graham Kendrick, we sing these words, From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled. Jesus' glory wasn't discontinued. It was veiled so that he could come uh, and live amongst us. And verse 8, Jesus humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. You see, Jesus, of course, was immortal. He was the eternal second person of the Trinity. Uh, we, we're mortal uh, and death comes to us. But Jesus had to succumb willingly to death. Uh, and not just any death, but death on a cross, a terrible cruel, painful, humiliating death. Cicero, who was a Roman politician and philosopher in the first century BC, described crucifixion as this most cruel and hideous of punishments. It was reserved for rebels and anarchists and slaves. Ordinary Roman citizens uh, would never be subject to crucifixion. And it was a shameful death for a Jew. In Deuteronomy, we, we read that, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And that's why Paul would write to the Galatians that Christ became a curse for us. And that's maybe why the, the cross is a stumbling block to Jewish people. Uh, how could the, the promised Messiah possibly end up nailed to a Roman cross, nailed to a tree? And again, in, in the Servant King, that song, we sing, hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And remember, Paul's trying to point the people to Jesus. He's trying to say, uh, look at Jesus, look at his attitude. That's what should inform the way you deal with one another. And then in verses 9 to 12, we see the amazing reversal that followed as God exalted Jesus. God restored him uh, to the glory that he once had as he rose from the dead and as he returned to heaven. And God gave him the name that is above every name, uh, that, that name the Lord, the Greek word kyrios translates the Hebrew Yahweh from the Old Testament. That, that word, the Lord. And before him, every knee will one day bow. Every, 
and knee will bow to the one who was humbled and became nothing. They will either bow willingly as saviour or, or bow reluctantly as judge. And God said, speaking through the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before, before me every knee will bow and every tongue, by me every tongue will swear. See, Jesus was restored to his rightful place in, in all his glory in heaven. And so Paul points the, the Philippians, who seem to be having some, some disagreements, maybe facing opposition, he points them uh, to Jesus. And he says, when you're looking at your situation, when you're looking at one another, look at Jesus first. See what he went through uh, for you. I think there, there are two simple lessons for, for us today from that uh, very profound passage. We could spend an awful long time on it. First of all, for those who aren't followers of Jesus, Paul calls us to acknowledge our sin uh, and to seek forgiveness. Uh, he, he says that one day every knee will bow to Jesus. We have the opportunity to acknowledge our sin, to seek forgiveness, to bow the knee gladly to him as Lord in our lives. And for those who are already followers of Jesus, we need to put aside rivalry and disagreement and division. To face a society opposed to the gospel, the Philippians had to be united, and so do we. Uh, when, we're, when we're divided, then we're weak. Uh, when we're united together, when Christians are united, then we're, then we're strong to face the opposition of, of a very godless society. Jesus himself said that a household divided against itself cannot stand. And that's true of, of the church as well. If we're always at one another's throats, if we're, our churches are full of disputes and disagreements, we will never make much of an impact on a world which needs to hear the gospel. See, not only uh, do we become weak when we disagree, but divisions among, in the church or among churches or between churches are very damaging to its witness. Many people look at the church and look at the divisions and look at the disputes between one church and another and one denomination and another, and even between Christians within a church. And they say, well, if, if that's what being a Christian is about, I, I don't want to know. And so our disunity and our disagreements can affect the gospel uh, which we, we want to proclaim. I've told you before, but it's worth telling you again the story of a man who found himself stranded on a desert island. And he was there for a long time. And finally, he managed to attract the attention of a passing ship, and they sent a boat in uh, to, to rescue him. And he was pointing out the buildings on, on his island, and he said, that's, over there, that's my house. Uh, and over at the far side there, that's the church I go to. And one of the rescuers said, and that building up on the hill, what's that? And the man said, oh, that's the church I used to go to. And isn't it true that we have so many divisions, and churches form out of splits, uh, and people get fed up with something, don't like something, move off and start another church, or, or we don't like something that's said in the church we belong to, or someone annoys us, and we, we move and find another church, maybe expecting it to be perfect. And people look on and see disunity. Alec Mateer, the great pastor and Bible teacher, said, Sadly, we accept divided local fellowships as normal, and worldwide divisions as standard, and then wonder why, for the most part, the church is steadily withdrawing from the opposing world. You see, we need to have that same attitude as Jesus. We need to treat one another as he treats us. Jesus said, that that's how people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another, because that will stand in sharp contrast to what people see all around them in the world, in their, their work, in their schools, uh, amongst their neighborhoods, day by day. And the opposite is also true. If we are disunited, not only will it make us weak as a church, but it will drive people away from Jesus. It will drive away the very people that we want to proclaim the gospel to. There are many issues in the world church we, we can't deal with, of course. They're way beyond our ability to, to deal with them. But there are issues we can deal with locally. Uh, we can seek to get on with one another in our own church. We, we will have differences. We'll have differences of opinions about, about secondary things. We might have different ways we like to do things. We, may, we have different personalities and we get on better with some than others. But we can put aside those as we look at Jesus and seek to love one another with the same love that he had for, had for us. And we can look at other churches. Other churches, if they're Bible-believing churches, they might not do things exactly the way we do. But we can rejoice that they're proclaiming the gospel and we can seek to get on with them. Uh, thank God that, that in, in the town here, we, we do work together. The churches work together and we want people to see that Christians are united. We might be from slightly different backgrounds, different traditions, but we're united in proclaiming the, the gospel. We need to guard our fellowship against division, against disunity. That's what Paul was saying to this church, a good church, a strong church, a church that was going for 10 years, 
but where there were beginning to be personalities and disagreements uh, which were going to affect the witness of the church uh, and divide the church and cause problems to the gospel. We need to learn the same lessons as Paul did. We need to uh, have that, uh, the attitude, the same attitude as Christ Jesus. The attitude that Jesus had to one another and to the world that needs to hear uh, the gospel. With God's help, we need to live lives that are worthy of the gospel of Jesus and worthy of citizens of heaven. Uh, May God help us as we seek to do that, as we seek to, to glorify him in our lives, in our church, and in the society in which he's placed us. Thomas DeLong is a businessman who landed himself the dream job at the Harvard Business School. And he was so delighted, this was a great success for him, but he said that it didn't take long before every morning walking to work he felt like a failure. And the reason why he felt like a failure every morning was because he walked past, he had to walk past the office of a man who had written over a dozen books. Thomas had written two, this man had written over 12, um, was, was very successful, very famous, and very likable. And he said every morning he walked past that office, he felt so small. And he says well, he could have walked from the other direction, came from his office from the other side of the hall. But he said to do that meant walking past the office of another man who the previous year had won the Nobel Prize at, for economics. And so there he was, either side, uh, cut between a rock and a hard place, comparing himself to these two very successful men. And he gives advice to businessmen, he says, or businesswomen, he says, I would urge you to find your own measure for providing a constant reminder that you're on track or not and help you avoid falling into the comparing behavior trap. We can all do it, can't we compare ourselves to other people? And it never, it usually doesn't end up end well for us. When we compare ourselves to others, it's usually because we feel like a failure. Everybody else around us um, it seems more successful, maybe in their jobs, maybe in their appearance, maybe in their, their parenting, maybe on social media or whatever it is. We compare ourselves to others and we feel so small. He says, I would urge you to find your own measure to avoid the comparison trap. Well, as Christians, and in the passage that we've just been looking at, we see that we are given a measure. We are given something that we are to compare ourselves to. And we see the person of Jesus. And we see that in our Saviour Jesus, we fix our eyes in one who, who didn't come to be successful, but he came to offer himself as a sacrifice. And in that sacrifice, we find ourselves who do fail and who don't measure up. And we can own that and we can give it to Jesus. And that he gave himself for us. And then he gives us a model of how we are to live not in trying to, to, to be great and be successful, but to be, live lives of sacrifice for others because of his sacrifice for us. So as we come to the table this morning, to take the bread, which reminds us of Jesus' body, we take the, the wine, which reminds us of Jesus' blood. I don't know if you're in that comparison trap, comparing yourselves to others, or whether you're feeling guilty, whether you're feeling just weary and tired. We come to the cross, to the one who who takes those burdens off us, who bore our sins in his body on the tree on our behalf, and we come and rest in him. I'm going to to read these verses again. I'm not going to say very much more. Just to read these verses and let us meditate on the loveliness and the love of Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross.
let's take a moment just to, to I'll leave those verses up on the screen and we can read them and reflect before we take the bread which speaks of his body. For I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Father, we do thank you. We thank you that you gave your Son. And Lord, we, we confess that whenever we try to measure ourselves either to others or even to you in your holy law, Lord, we find ourselves falling short. But we thank you so much for grace. We thank you for Jesus, who stands with open arms um, and offers us his un, unmerited love and favour. And he beckons us into a relationship with him. So Lord, help us now to, to give up those, those burdens which we are laying upon ourselves, whether we're comparing ourselves to others, whether we feel small, we feel like failures. Father, we thank you that we are loved in you, that Jesus gave up his body for us. He didn't come to be successful. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he gave his life as a ransom for people like us. So we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And we come and rest in his sacrifice for us now. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed in him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our Father, we thank you that as your Son gave himself up, he was purchasing for himself sinners from every tribe, tongue, and nation, so that we could come and be in you. And Lord, we thank you that now we can bow our knees before him and glorify his name, cleansed by his blood, sanctified, set apart for you, forgiven for all of our sins and given a new purpose and a new life. We thank you that he died and we thank you that he rose again and now he has risen, he is exalted and we bow before him and worship you and give, us, give you our lives. And so Lord, we pray that you would free us from from that comparison trap, free us from the guilt of sin. Give us the power by your Holy Spirit to walk in a newness of life, a new resurrection power, and live lives that, that honour you, and live lives that give you glory. Lord, in all that we would do, we would be confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Lord, we pray that um, as we have taken this bread, as, as we've taken this wine, we pray that you would continue to work in our hearts that our lives would be not be about us being successful, but Lord, our lives would be about being like Jesus, being servant-hearted, pouring ourselves out for you and for others, and that you would be glorified in us. And all that we do, that you would get the honour and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to finish our morning with another song. And let us respond now with, with worship, with praising him, um, with hearts not searching for a significance in our success, but just reveling in his sacrifice and in the rest that he offers to us. And as we head into another week, let us live not for ourselves, trying to compare ourselves to others, to outdo each other in our success, but resting in him and all that he has done for us and enjoying all the good gifts that he has given to us in the proper way. So let us sing now, and God bless. i
Let's go.